Well, let's get more now on the government's anti-strike legislation, which will set minimum service levels for fire, ambulance and rail services when the sectors decide to take action. The bill will leave unions at risk of being sued if they fail to comply. Well, joining me now with the Conservative MP for Newbury, Laura Farris. And, and what is your view about this potential uh, anti-strike legislation? Well, I, I don't think I would call it anti-strike legislation because... Um, minimum service levels in essential services are common practice in all uh, the states that we would identify as similar in Canada, Australia, the United States, um, Italy, Spain. So this is just bringing uh, British legislation into line with our European uh, equivalents, really. Mm. Uh but the, the fact of the matter is that the strike action that has been that has happened so far does appear to make a difference, doesn't it? We, we know that the government is, is now going back to the rail uh, operating companies and saying you can offer more money. Uh, they wouldn't have done that, would they not, had the strikes not happened? So it, it kind of shows that the strikes do make an impact, doesn't it? Well, I think in any liberal democracy, any functioning liberal democracy, there is a kind of healthy ebb and flow between trade unions and governments, and that would be true in any of the countries that I've just listed. But th that's actually a separate point from minimum service levels, and they don't apply in every sector, so plenty of sectors would still be able to, to strike in the usual way. But it's simply the sectors, actually, they were already identified in the 2016 Trade Union Acts. There are six of them that are identified as very important public services. They include things like fire, so that if the union wishes to go on, on strike, the public can still feel confident that a domestic fire will not be allowed to rage unchecked. There will still be an engine that can come out equally for Category 1 ambulance services. There will still be an ambulance on call. And actually, the right to strike has never been an unqualified right. Sometimes you listen to opposition politicians and they make it sound as if it's an unbridled right. It's not. Uh, Article 11 of the European Convention of Human Rights, where it sits, allows it to be restricted as long as those restrictions are necessary and proportionate. And the International Labour Organization, which is a, a UN agency of which the UK is a founding member, has approved minimum service levels so, so long as they're confined to the most important services in all of the countries I listed before, from Canada to Italy, Australia to France, and so, as I say, it's bringing our legislation in line with others. It shouldn't be conflated with what happens in any individual strike and the way the government of the day will respond. But it does give the public that confidence that the most important services will still offer a basic level of protection, irrespective of industrial action. But that already happens, doesn't it? We saw with the ambulance strike that those most severe category uh, responses were still being responded to. That's a very good example, actually. So that's not quite right. We saw with the nurses' strike that there was a voluntary agreement to put in a sort of national minimum level that would meet the requirements that are set out in this bill. But with ambulances, what you saw was localised arrangements done on an ad hoc basis. Sometimes the local NHS trust didn't find out till the morning what, if anything, uh, was going to be provided. And when you looked at the Category 1 services, so that is the most critical call-out services on the day, the, the times varied wildly depending on where you were in the country. Now, you have actually made a really good that, point, that, which with, is... With the greatest respect, that, that is the, the point that the ambulance workers are, are, are striking about, though, isn't it? They would say that, actually, whether it was a strike day or not, the, the, their response times are varying massively because they're absolutely struggling to, to offload their patients. There is a difference between Category 1, where, actually, ambulance response times have remained very consistent, close to the 10-minute maximum, and Category 2, where we have seen much wider um, variation anyway. It's a fair point to make. But this is about Category 1, which is the most critical. So if, for example, there was a massive road accident on a motorway, the call-out time for that. And, and, and it is fair that it shouldn't depend on where you are in the country to know that if you are, for example, in a huge motorway accident, there will still be a critical blue light service to come out. And actually, one of the things that is worth saying, and is a draconian step that the British government wouldn't take and haven't contemplated taking, is that you can ban strikes. So, for example, in the United States, 30 out, 38 out of 52 states ban public sector strikes altogether. President Biden signed legislation in December that banned a national railroad strike. That would be the equivalent of our railways. Now, we don't do that. And it's interesting, actually, even, even those bans, all-out bans, have been upheld by the International Labour Organization as lawful. So the government could have gone further. It hasn't gone further. It's protecting the right to strike, but it is saying that when the service is one of essential public importance, then some minimum level must be maintained on a national basis. 
Are you confident that the government has taken the right position on, on strikes? Because when we look at public opinion, you mentioned the nurses, public opinion in terms of support for nurses striking has gone up in favour of the nurses since they first started striking. And in and, and some respects, you might uh, have expected people to go the other way. When they became personally inconvenienced, you would have think that they would, they would perhaps have less sympathy, but it hasn't. It's raised the, the nurses' concerns in people's minds and more members of the public now support the nurses as a result of striking. Well, I think if you look across different sectors, you see different levels of public support. In fact, the story is totally different when you look, for example, at education or transport. And I think, actually, the critical thing is not looking at strikes through the prism of whether or not an opinion poll says the public or pro or against, and, and nor should it be seen as a conflict between the government and the trade union. They are having negotiations. I mean, I'm a backbench MP, so I can't pretend to know what's happening, but I know that the door is open and those conversations, although they're sort of only beginning and progressing, are happening. So I'm not tr here to sort of create a defensive position. But I think that the issue with this legislation is not about um, whether or not it does or doesn't chime with public support. It's about the absolute basic protection which the government thinks the public are entitled to when the most critical services choose to go on strike. And I think that, that the challenge really for the Labour Party is to explain why it is we should lag behind every country, countries in the G7, countries we would consider very, very similar democracies and economies to our own, why the British people should have a lower standard of basic protection than all of our neighbours. OK, Laura Farris, Conservative MP for Newbury, thank you very much for joining us.